You are watching the World Cleanup Day show coming to you live from Manhattan in New York City with our other call center 5,000 miles to the east back in Tallinn in Estonia. And look who I'm joined by. We met before a few years ago, former president of Estonia, Kirsty Kaljulaj. Hello, and also thank you for the beautiful song. It's very, very moving and very nice song to use when you are you know, picking up stuff, uh, which is not so nice. And now we have the former president to sing a song. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> you were the president of Estonia between 2016 and 21? 21. 21. What was it like being president of Estonia? It's a fantastic feeling. You feel like you are carried forward by your own people, supported by your own people, and you can do so many great things together with your people. And when you are outside of the country, then basically we are not living in so peaceful times nowadays, even if it wasn't quite that bad, but bad things were already coming. We saw the clouds. Then you really think of your own people and those close by and try to do the best to make the world the safest place for um, them. We're sitting here in the Estonian house in Manhattan, but, and this is like a hub for the Estonian community here yes, in Yes, and it wouldn't York. be here if we didn't have had an occupation of our country then, I mean, but during all these 50 years, this building served as the point where Estonians gathered. And by the way, went to demonstrate that UN and other important meetings really? for our independence. Yes, they never gave up. U.S. never recognized our occupation, of course, mm. but then it was worth going every U.N. General Assembly and also all Russian embassies globally, mostly here also in Sweden, and to basically demonstrate one Estonian lady who later married uh, Tuna Kelamaua, our member of European Parliament, he stood for decades in front of the embassies and, and yelled, Niet, niet, sovieta ta svoboda, <laughs> under our flag. <laughs> And that's amazing that this building was always used then to lobby the UN because of its close proximity. Absolutely, absolutely. But also, of course, Estonian vibes survived here. Estonians could gather here. And mm. you know, I lived in occupied Estonia, yeah. but I knew I had relatives in Australia and also I knew they had their own journals. I knew where they were writing about, I mean, that Estonia once was free. I knew our flag. So and I a mean, lot of that originated you, here. Uh, what? A lot of that originated here. Here, indeed, yes. Here uh, was one of the main hubs, and you knew about it back home, and it helped. It helped that there are still people who are free to talk about blue, black, and white. That is amazing. Yeah. The blue, black, and white. And when we say that it was used to lobby and put pressure on the United Nations for the recognition of Estonia, now we see even today for the World Cleanup Day, they're using it because of its close proximity to put pressure again on the UN for recognition for what's happening on the World Cleanup Day. Tell me a bit about Kirsty. The World Cleanup Day is six years old, but it started as a national cleanup day in Estonia. Uh, how did it transition? Tell me about that transition from national to global and why? Basically, we started to get questions. You're used to, if you're Estonian, you get questions about our digital prowess, but then people suddenly started to ask questions about this thing. What do you mean? All people go voluntarily, pick up. I mean, garbage from woods. What do you achieve with that? You cannot, I mean, make that as a main kind of way of keeping your country clean. And then we explain that, no, no, that is one part of it is indeed, I mean, making sure that we work well and, and gather the stuff which shouldn't be where it is. But the most important part is if you have once ever cleaned up a kilometer of a roadside from Tallinn to Tartu, you will never ever throw out the coffee cup from your window, which of course is, I mean, incomprehensible that people do it, yes. but they do, unfortunately. Even in beautiful Estonia? Yes, and elsewhere as well. I, I would say Estonians and Eastern Europeans in general are pretty good at keeping clean. I mean, there are more developed nations who are used to the cleanliness which comes from that somebody picks up after them. Yes. We are, well, we, we have never had that luxury, and so, uh, so we, are, we are pretty good. But, but still, yes, there yes. is room for improvement everywhere, and that's why World Cleanup Day rang the bell globally, and that's how, how it now developed into what it is. And how do you think on a national level you change the psyche in society in Estonia because we talked about this before and as you just mentioned in developed countries uh, people say of course I've got to keep my space my home my front garden clean but beyond my front garden the road the neighborhood that's not my responsibility that's the job of the government that's why I pay my taxes someone will be employed to clean up that mess yeah this is true but I mean if you think seriously about it how much of your national GDP could be directed to far worthier causes mm. 
if it was less spent on cleaning up the garbage. And after all, I mean, what's the use of... Yeah, indeed, I've seen cities where in the morning you can see what the pavement is, lunchtime it's barely deductible, and in the evening you cannot say whether it's asphalt or cobblestone. Yeah. I mean, that means that 80% of the day everything looks nasty. Do you really want to live in such a space? I don't. And I think that's why the World Cleanup Day rings bell as well in, in big urban spaces like New York, for example. They've been cleaning up Central Park here. And then why did it go national to global? I know it was coincide with your celebration of independence in 2000. And this is one yeah, element, but you know also World Cleanup Day always had a very big support of Estonian startup community. And the startup community in Estonia never thinks locally. I it mean, if you, if you are, for example, French or Polish, you may create a company which concentrates on home market. Yep. If you're in Estonia, you immediately create a company which has 99% of clients outside. Okay. So, because this was also, I mean, part of the circle of Estonia startup community, it acted that's like a startup, and that's how it basically grew. So, because Estonia is so small with one million people, it's kind of like a survival method for companies. They can't think local, they've got to think global. Absolutely, yeah. You, you don't even think about creating a company which serves local people unless it's a bakery. I mean, yeah. if you, if you want to do a kind of, uh, I don't know, digital testing system or negotiating software or whatever, I mean, you immediately think of Walmart. You don't think of, uh, of Selver back home. And the Estonian government has always been supportive of World Cleanup Day. Now, at the beginning, Absolutely. there was a lot of... Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but again, if someone asked, well, we can understand why the Estonian government wants to help fund and support national cleanup because it's in their best interest, but why is it the business of Estonia to support something that's helping cleaning up Turkey or yeah, Iran? You know, it's always like everybody thinks small countries are, like they say in diplomacy, demandeurs, somebody who needs something from the bigger ones. I'm sorry, we don't. We don't consume global security or contribute to it by our, our straightforward thinking and also by our participation in NATO spending 2%. Similarly, we contribute to the global community where we can. And you know, for, for nice things to happen, you don't need be catalyzed. I mean, catalyzed is by definition a small thing, mm. but which makes things happen. So we want to contribute globally. This is our ambition. And, uh, and this is, I mean, comes from business, goes to NGOs and also our government. We always want to make the world a better place because you never know when you need the help of your friends. And then you need to have friends. How to great friends? You offer them great ideas, what you have, and that's why. It's interesting when I travel around the world reporting for TV, TV and radio, particularly in Africa and Asia, when they say, oh, you're from Ireland? And they immediately think of the missionary priests and nuns who went there over the past hundred or something years and helped the poorest of the poor, people who needed education and food. So it's a bit like that too, that people would go on and there could be this kind of legacy of, oh, Estonia, Yes, you're involved, of course, with technology and so on, but with the cleanup as well. Yes, with making the, the missionary world... of cleanup. I yes. mean, we are everywhere, exactly where your ancestors went. Probably we are in all those countries as well, because we now cover, I think, close to 190 or even maybe more territories and, and states. I mean, some count Kosovo in, some says it's a territory. So, yeah. I mean, there are these kind of things. But overall, it's, it's at least 20 million people and, uh, and a high number of uh, countries involved. And it's all on grassroots level. I mean, yeah. it's not like governments got together and put together a network. And I believe this is the 21st century diplomacy. We very much used it also in our UN Security Council campaign, where our, our businesses and our people got cozy with, with people from other countries and, and they realized they have, well, interesting ideas to share and offer and World Cleanup Day was also part of that process definitely of how Estonia, small Nordic nation wants to be well able to help the rest of the world to, to well do some nice things. And not without its challenges as well because when you think about going global and all those territories not all equal of course the developed countries people have the time to take off work the luxury to go and help cleaning up but then you look at Mongolia, where I was a few weeks ago, or countries in Africa. When we talk about reducing your carbon footprint, reducing fossil fuels, they'll say, well, hang on, we need to keep burning coal because we need electricity for the heater and for the stove to make food. By the way, I think that would be one of the world's general global lowest hanging fruits to provide solar cells with some battery capacity mm. to all those people who use these pluttering diesel generators, which anyway don't give you electricity 24 7 365. Anyway, they're used to kind of shortages, limitations that, I mean, maybe before the morning your battery runs out if you have a solar cell. 
And I really think that the, the world could, could do this, I mean, but you need to find a, a, well, an adequate transfer mechanism of technology which would then reach uh, these people who, the, who it needs to reach. Mm. So there are many things actually where developing nations could already do better if we only, I mean, realize that we, uh, we, we need to concentrate focus and get one thing maybe done. And we are, we are far too widespread and competing in our ideas yes. on how to help uh, developing nations. On the other hand, you know what? World Cleanup Day is something which gives these people there the sense of empowerment. Yes. And it is so needed. Because if you cannot do much to make your life better, at least you can do quite a lot to make your life cleaner. Yes. And because it's grassroots and it's not a big, wealthy organization, it's not coming in throwing money at the problem, yeah. saying, hey, we come into whatever country, insert here. There's all the money trying yes. to clean up. It's like, well, we have, you got to do it yourself. Yes. And you know, I've noticed very often when there is quite a lot of donor money, let's say in healthcare, yeah. the national governments let this money outgrow their own initiatives. And this means that, I mean, more and more these, I mean, out, this money which comes from outside in takes responsibility for what government actually should be responsible, yes. allowing yeah. them to spend their revenues elsewhere, not making what donors brought part of their healthcare system, so on, so on. So this is a big problem of donor money. But with this exercise. Indeed, I mean, it is kind of a little partisan thing which people themselves can do together with Estonian people. And yes, nobody's bought into the idea. Everybody has to find it really empowering for themselves. And is there any danger in that too, as World Cleanup Day becomes bigger and bigger and is partnering with different people that governments say, oh, well, look, we don't have to lead the, the cause for environmental cleanups because World Cleanup Day are doing that. Earth Day is taking care of that. They have it in hand. Yeah, luckily, this has never been a tool to really, I mean, handle garbage in any country, not even in Estonia when it originated. Maybe some local politicians had an ambition that, okay, all my woods will be clean, I have to do nothing. But no, yeah. you just get a more demanding uh, general public who will demand local governments to, I mean, help them to keep their country clean. That yes. is what they get, but it will never be, be overtaken or outcrowded, I mean, because this initiative deals with, I mean, simple people, pair of hands and a few apps. And this is never enough to have a system, but it is enough to kind of put the pain into where it is needed. Now, Kirsty, you, uh, you know, politician, a very successful one who rose to the very top of political power in Estonia, represented your country 2016, 2021. The big thing for many groups around the world at World Cleanup Day is they want to engage their local municipalities or councils, even on a national level. Um, they find it very hard to do so because these politicians have a lot of people trying to get their time and attention and for them to get behind their cause. We've heard so many different ways of people trying to lobby them, shame them into getting involved, um, convincing them that, look, it's going to look great if you come for the photograph while we're cleaning, it'll be good for your political career. What's the best way to get a, a politician or a political body behind your cause and supporting it? I've noticed myself that when I went together with a, a particular country's clean-up team to a park or something, it actually sparked great interest of, a, of a national politicians, but I cannot be everywhere. Yeah. So indeed, I think the best, the best way to do is to find somebody who will buy into your ideas and, and is ready to champion them. Because, you know, politicians are simple beings. They do what the voters want finally but you just have to get enough of the voter pressure of course in some countries democracies are not quite that strong the link between vote and the elected yes. politician can be weaker but still there is no other way i have found than smilingly try to trust your own country's democratic democratic process try to support not to be negative and critical try to be kind of embracing i mean trying to find somebody you can thank in advance for taking great interest in your initiative. Someone, I like that. You can thank in advance. <laughs> yes. Thanks so much for the interest you're going to take in this cleanup because all the people in your constituency really want this to happen. So it's trying to convince them that it's the people who want it and it would be good for them to get behind it. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you see the numbers globally, they're so big. You cannot ignore such an amount of people. And of mm. course, people want their streets to be clean and, and their surroundings to be clean. By the way, I've never understood, for example, how somewhere, even I mean, people who have resources do not care about how the streets look. But then the simple people who cannot fly in a helicopter over these streets, they still do. And of course, it's very important to, to get these people also 
also heard. So that's very important. What do you think is next, Kirsty, for the World Cleanup Day? We're here now trying to get on the calendar of the United Nations to get that support and backing, which would be huge. But where do you see World Cleanup Day going from here? I think it has to really uh, team up with other UN initiatives because we've already noticed, for example, that uh, very often it is women in communities who take up, I mean, World Cleanup Day, and this gives them first chance to, I mean, manage a project out of, outside of their home. So I see also there are great social benefits. So teaming up, for example, for people who work for girls and women and adolescents in developing nations could be the next step to also make sure that this kind of many faceted benefit of the initiative comes out. And of course, since we all realize that fight against climate change is really the biggest fight, well, for us in Eastern Europe, of course, uh, we, we now are a little bit doubtful, maybe fight uh, in Ukraine for time being mm. is for us the number one fight, but yet... Climate change is happening and, and fighting climate change, getting plastic out of the environment, these things, they are more and more important. And again, in order to make sure that our young people do not feel hopeless, you need to give them something which they can do. And World Cleanup Day is exactly this. Don't worry, just do, keep doing. If we all keep doing, the 8 billion of us, yeah. We are 20 million, so that is a space to upscale still. And Kirsty, it's bit by bit, isn't it? Because you mentioned uh, the war in Ukraine. We have our friends here in the call center from Venezuela and the terrible problems that Venezuela has uh, faced in a country I was in last year with Pope Francis, South Sudan, and the problems they face. So it's hard for these countries to keep world cleanup or any environmental issues at the top of their priority. They have many other problems. So, but it's just keeping it in the zeitgeist or just keeping it on the agenda in some way. Yes, on big, on big matters which seem undoable at the first glance, I'm now very often using the favorite proverb of my Ukrainian friends who say, how do you eat elephant? Do you know how do you eat elephant? I, how do you eat, I don't know how you eat an elephant. One, One bite, bite at, at, a, at a, time. a time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> One bite at a time. And uh, there is nothing more than people could do, but we are eight billion. Eight billion bites at any moment. Yes. And tomorrow again. That's yeah. a lot. And when you have, uh, like, World Cleanup Day, 70-something million people, 70-plus million people, small bites, but 70 together, 70 million? Absolutely. That's a huge, big chunk then. Being yes, absolutely. And, and as I said, it's not just getting the world cleaner. It's putting pres pressure on politicians who would then see that this matters to people. It really matters to people. I mean, there are countries in Africa where plastic, for example, is forbidden. I think in Senegal you cannot use plastic bags. Because, really? Yeah, because they look, I mean, they look very nasty on the roadside and animals in savannas keep eating them and wow. so on. So they don't do plastic bags in shops. Wow. So it can be done. Absolutely. It can be done. Absolutely it can be done. Finally, to uh, finish, Kirsty, uh, yourself, we started talking about you personally, how you were president. Uh, you know, they say, oh, well, after you leave office, you'll have some spare time, but you've been as busy as ever. I see on your social media, you're still traveling. You were in Ukraine recently, I believe, and you were in Washington. Uh, what is your life filled with today? Actually, what I'm doing stems mostly from the popular demand back home. People expect their president who is capable of talking to the outside world or explaining to school children how democracy works. They are expected to keep working on those subjects and that is what I keep doing. But are you enjoying life? Yes. But I've always enjoyed life, even, even when I was uh, not, uh, not in politics. Growing up, there were little moments, even in Occupy Estonia, which you could enjoy. Really? Yeah, but I do remember... What were those moments of happiness and joy? You know, there was not much to do, so we, we celebrated all birthdays of all the family, and my grandmother had ten sisters and a few brothers as well. So, I mean, we had basically, once or twice a week, we had so a, a party. party in your house because, you know, because you couldn't travel, that was not, not allowed. I wow. mean, you, you, you couldn't write in newspapers because you didn't write in, in red newspapers, and your own ideas were were not welcomed by the society. So all you had was family life. You mm. just dropped into your, your family members, your neighbors. Actually, community-wise, we survived as a, as a community. And this is actually what you see also in Ukraine today. 
these societies are able to survive as communities, even if government is busy fighting elsewhere, wow. the community doesn't break down. And that's the difference in Ukraine, if you compare in some other countries where, where the communities have not been able to, I mean, keep together, keep themselves fed and, and things done. Ukrainians are showing how actual it was also 30, 40, 50 years ago in my country. That's you just ignore, I mean, that there is a government because you know government is not coming to your help. So you handle you. stuff yourself. So you think there are things that are lost from, yeah, I know it sounds crazy, but occupied Estonia that were that were beautiful and special, like that community feeling that you had, that you fostered But we, we still have it. The, we still have it. That is why we got World Cleanup Day going, because yes. we still have it. We still don't expect them. That we don't say, we pay taxes, you do the rest. Yeah. We still help our elderly neighbors. We still do all these but in things. in a lot of parts of the world, they've lost that. People don't know their neighbors. They know yes. their friends on Facebook, on the other side of the world. They stay in touch with friends on Instagram, but they don't know the person next door, or they don't have time yes. to check in with the neighbor. You know, that is why uh, in UN, we are also striving to get it in, uh, understood in the educating community of the developed nations that we the technology in the hands of our children, which is a great thing for education. Special attention in education needs to go to being compassionate human being. How to be a compassionate human being? Because when you were tiny, I was tiny, you went to the shop, you needed to buy something, you needed to get the right amount of money back. They were all low risk, low level interactions, which yes. taught us how people in society operate. Mm. Our children don't learn it anymore. Just in the air like yeah. we did they learned technology in intuitively yeah. we learned emotional intelligence and now it's vice versa and the schools really need to understand i That's mean this is how it is point here yeah, now because if they need to get something from the shop they'll get it on amazon same day delivery yeah or even if you it. go to the shop i mean there is no uh, cashier no checkout i mean where a human service. being de yeah. deals with you wow. so you never understand if somebody says i'm okay then you're not able to read that actually they are masking their bad feelings. they're not okay, yeah. yeah. Precisely. And we see sadly increased levels of anxiety, especially among young people in the world yeah, today. And yeah, yeah. The, um, when you were growing up though, did you ever, did you want to be a politician? Did you want to be? Oh, come on, no. I studied my, I, I studied na natural sciences because that was the first, uh, the, really the far, so far from the communist regime, which you could be laboratory, woods, wherever. But I mean, uh, for example, my mother, she wanted to study physics and she was not allowed because this was war science and my family was anti-communist. Yeah. And, and therefore, I mean, even 1950s, she only could be a doctor or, or study natural science. She wasn't as well. allowed to study physics. Yeah, I was probably, I would have probably been allowed, but you definitely didn't study history or law. Okay. Because my grandmother always said, don't study those. If the system changes, it's useless because she was a lawyer. And after serving 10 years in Soviet Gulag, yes. she worked as a, a, a natural, uh, at the Estonian Academy of Science in a relatively quiet uh, job, which had, had absolutely nothing to do with her profession. And they, didn't, they didn't want you studying law, uh, law or history in case they gave you kind of the tools or ideas to go into something like politics or be um, someone who fought No, for. it was just that, I mean, the, the history History was history studies was full of lies, okay. and law studies meant you need to be part of the oppressive the system. system. Yeah. So of course, I mean, no, nobody wanted to be part of that. Of course, some people had no kind of these strong anti-communist leanings, so there was no lack of lawyers in the Soviet Estonia. There were people who were happy to do it, but uh, my family not. But isn't it amazing that you went on from that country that was uh, oppressed and when it was liberated? You then you became the president of that country. Yeah, it's I think my one. grandmother would be really proud if she, if there is somewhere where uh, where uh, grandmothers see their grandchildren, uh, I'm sure if she's happy. And my even in your in your occupied times, you couldn't even believe that you couldn't believe in religion or God or spirituality. No, 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 definitely not. I mean, I. I thought that maybe Soviet Union will one day collapse because basically in my childish brain, I thought that uh, I mean, otherwise our nation will be lost because there are so many fenno ugric nations within Russia who do not get their culture appreciated even today mm. and I was really fearing for our, our nation to, to be gone from this planet and I was thinking very often which goes first, Soviet Union or, or being an Estonian because Soviets like to kind of move people around the Soviet Union to create kind of unified Soviet person. Okay, and, uh, and not loyal them. to one area yeah. or one group or territory. Absolutely, but they, they failed miserably because of this community feeling. Wow, that is amazing. That same community feeling that we have here uh, grassroots level at World Cleanup Day. Yeah. That is amazing. I could talk to Kirsty here for hours. Let's just for the next 
20 hours, we're going to have a conversation. Is that okay? And we'll just stream the whole thing. Um, I, I cannot do it because I have to talk to Financial Times about this global education report recommendations, which are not even public. So I have to talk about something which they haven't seen. So uh, you didn't give me the song at the start. I didn't get an Estonian song, even a Eurovision one. And now you've got to go to these if meetings. If you want somebody to sing, our Minister of Foreign Affairs is, 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 over, is over in New York. And he really is good. So okay. try, to, try to get hang of him in the next few days. We'll and, hold him and to make it. Markus sing. <laughs> Kirsty Kalulide, it was a pleasure speaking to you and thank you so much for your thank time you. as well.